Welcome to our uh, second uh, discussion event of this semester. Uh, it's entitled uh, Super Tuesday and Beyond, uh, looking ahead toward 2024's national and state elections. Um, and uh, we'll be uh, talking about, as the uh, title implies, um, mostly national elections, um, although we may also discuss state elections and other elections as well. Um, it's kind of up to you guys to some extent. Um, so um, <clears throat> without uh, too much further uh, ado, we'll go ahead and uh, get ourselves uh, started here. So uh, this is a virtual panel discussion that is being hosted by the Department of Political Science and the School of Education and Behavioral Sciences at Middle Georgia State University. Um, we are co-sponsored by the uh, MGA uh, Political Science Student Organization, as well as the Alpha Mu Zeta chapter of Pi Sigma Alpha, which is our National Honorary Society for um, Political Science. Um, excuse me. Um, and uh, before we do get started, just want to uh, tell you a little bit about our department and, pro and its programs for those of you that might be uh, um, unfamiliar with us. Um, so our department uh, offers several different programs, including two bachelor's degrees, a bachelor of science in political science, as well as the bachelor of science in interdisciplinary studies. Uh, we also offer minors in uh, political science, African and African diaspora studies, environmental policy studies, Global Studies, uh, Pre-Law, and uh, starting in the fall of this year, we'll also be offering a minor in Local Government Administration as well. Uh, and those are undergraduate minors that are open to anybody with a bachelor's degree in another field, um, or for that matter, um, one of our fields. Um, so for example, if you were interested in, say, majoring in psychology or criminal justice and getting a minor in Pre-Law or a minor in political science or something like that, uh, that's always an option. We have uh, lots of different minors here of Lots of different minors being offered by the university, and these are certainly among the fine ones that are available. Uh, and then last but not least, we also are a participant in the uh, consortium of uh, about nine different universities and colleges in Georgia uh, that participate in the uh, Certificate on European Union Studies, uh, which deals with, as the title might imply, um, the European Union and uh, associated countries and things like that. So if you have interest in the uh, culture, politics, society of Europe, um, that might be a, uh, a certificate worth pursuing as well. And we also offer, uh, through the consortium, we offer a series of online classes in that uh, subject area. Uh, let's see. So um, let me uh, go ahead and uh, introduce you to our panelists um, for today. Um, so uh, we have uh, with us uh, Dr. Uh, John Hall, who is an associate professor of political science. Uh, he has been with us at Middle Georgia State University since 2015. His doctorate is in public policy administration uh, from uh, Auburn University. Uh, we're also joined today by uh, another of our colleagues in the department, uh, Dr. Matthew Caverly, who is a lecturer of political science. Um, he has been at MGA since 2016. Uh, his PhD is all in political science and from uh, the University of Florida. Um, and then uh, I am uh, going to be serving as our Moderator slash host slash um, system wrangler, I guess. Um, and uh, I am a Dr. Christopher Lawrence. I'm the uh, chair of the Department of Political Science and also a professor of political science. I've been here at MGA for um, about 12 years now, since 2012. And uh, my doctorate in political science is from uh, the University of Mississippi or Ole Miss. Um, so we have quite the SEC contingent going today. Um, so um, we have uh, discussed beforehand a few uh, potential uh, topics among the panelists, and we'll be uh, uh, starting with questions related to those. But um, we are also more than happy, as a matter of fact, uh, very happy. We, we love to have your questions as well. Um, so that's what the chat window is for if you want to post your uh, chat uh, questions uh, in the chat. Um, we will uh, try to get those. Um, usually we get through two or three of our pre-arranged questions first, and then um, we uh, then turn to the chat. But um, if something comes up earlier, we may bring it up earlier, or if there's a follow-up or something like that that needs to be brought up earlier, we can certainly bring that up earlier as well. Um, audience members are welcome to ask multiple questions if they want. Uh, we will prioritize answering uh, one question per participant. So. Uh, just in case there's somebody out there that really wants to ask a bunch of different questions, that's great. But we do want to make sure everybody has the opportunity to answer questions as well, or have their questions answered, I should say. 
Um, and then uh, please, uh, of course, also be courteous and civil to each other in the chat window. Make sure you are uh, abiding by the various and sundry guidelines for being part of the Middle Georgia State University uh, community. So um, these are some of the topics we may discuss today. I won't get into too much of them in detail, but um, but um, just so you are aware of of what they are. Um, and um, I think we'll start and launch with uh, um, a little bit of a relatively current event. Uh, so um, this morning, uh, the uh, Supreme Court of the United States issued a, a ruling on a fairly short uh, time scale um, that uh, regarded whether or not states could remove Donald Trump from remove or sorry, remove Donald Trump, former President Trump, uh, from their ballots for his alleged role in inciting the January 6, 2021 attack on the U.S. Capitol. Um, so my question for our panelists is, um, first, uh, what did the court rule and what was their reasoning and what is the impact of that ruling? So I'll, um, I'll jump in here real fast, uh, if that's okay. Sure. Thank you all for coming out again. Thank you, Chris. Uh, thank you, Matt, for being here. I noticed that the dean of our college, Dr. Uh, David Beek, is here. So welcome and welcome all students. Um, really quickly, the first question regarding the Supreme Court's opinion earlier today, it has to do with the state of Colorado removing former President Donald Trump from the ballot. Now, the big question that many might have is why would they do that? And it all boils down to the 14th Amendment. Now, really quickly, as we are discussing in our American government classes, uh, there are three amendments after the Civil War that we conveniently call the Civil War Amendments. The 13th ended chattel slavery. The 15th uh, tried to guarantee voting rights to African-American men. And then there's the 14th. The 14th has a lot of moving parts. Uh, but regarding this case, what we're going to talk about in the 14th is Section 3 that basically says, if you have ever taken part in an insurrection or rebellion against the United States, you are no longer able to serve in the federal government. Now, when this was ratified, obviously this was talking about former Confederate soldiers and officers who may want to then serve in the federal government. Uh, and Congress had been given the power with a two-thirds supermajority vote to let people serve again. So 150-ish years after the 14th ratification, it's back on the front page because of the January 6th insurrection that occurred at the Capitol. The question that Colorado's Supreme Court was asking was this, did then President Donald Trump's speech, particularly before the insurrection occurred, did that constitute his participation in insurrection? Uh, the Colorado Supreme Court said it did, and they removed him from the ballot. This morning, the Supreme Court overturned that. Now, why did they overturn that? It's important to note, they were not making any statements toward President Trump's guilt or innocence regarding an insurrection. What they were say saying is simply this, the states do not have the power to enforce Section 3 as it pertains to federal officers. Uh, and they basically said he has to be put back on the ballot. Congress in Section 5 of the 14th Amendment is given the power to enforce it. Now, the Supreme Court did say this morning that if the state of Colorado or any state for that matter feels that someone running for state office has violated the 14th Amendment, then they can remove them from the ballot. They simply can't do it for federal elections. And their logic was relatively somewhat sound. I mean, it was somewhat of a straightforward opinion. Um, it was a per curiam opinion. And they basically said, if we allow states to enforce uh, this provision of the 14th Amendment, it could create an unsustainable patchwork where some states allow you on the ballot, some states don't allow you on the ballot. That would be, as you could imagine, overwhelmingly problematic. So the Supreme Court's opinion was quite straightforward, and it was very much a landmark opinion saying that it is Congress that will enforce the anti-insurrection element of the 14th Amendment. Now, with that, I could keep talking for the next 30 minutes on this, but I'm gonna make sure I stop and uh, give Matt a chance to fill in any of the many blanks that I might've left. Well, you're very kind, John, but I, I don't think you really left any blanks. Um, uh, I think it, uh, I think there's, as the, being a public law theorist that you are, you did, uh, uh, you did, you covered all the ground. Uh, I think the, 
the only thing I would add is that um, I think there were a lot of uh, people sort of out there in the uh, uh, the blogosphere and the, uh, the the talking head zone and all of that in, in politics that that really wanted um, the courts to come down on whether or not the former president had been somehow uh, directly or indirectly complicit in the uh, in the insurrection itself. And the court, being the court, um, as uh, you know, as scholars have often argued that the uh, the Supreme Court is institutionally conservative, meaning that its reliance on precedent and the doctrines like stare decisis and so forth, that in general, um, even uh, so-called activist judges and those who embody judicial liberalism in practice um, are have a kind of philosophical conservatism. And to some extent, I think that we, we've seen this here. The other thing that I would say is that really this, you could argue this came down to the politics of intergovernmental relations, the politics of federalism, uh, that, uh, that, the, that the, um, the 14th Amendment uh, uh, was uh, talking about the, the uh, powers re relative to the federal government and that the, uh, the states in this case regarding offices to federal offices uh, don't have any power. They, they didn't have they don't have any skin in the game on that. Uh, and that's a classic uh, a classic notion of uh, the division of powers across the levels of government. Um, that uh, an interesting thing here, you could you could argue that the the marble cakers, the cooperative federalists, which would be the, the liberals in today's politics, would say, well, yeah, there you go. That's 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 national power. But you could also look at that from a different perspective and say that the dual dual federalists, the layer cakers, the states writers, uh, could could have their could have their own little uh, view on that, which is uh, um, you know that, that this was this was a, a national zone, uh, and uh, politics is for the states. But I found it interesting you mentioned the thing that well maybe the the, the states could deny uh, state office holders, and I think that would be very consistent with. Uh, with this decision, so it's it's an it's an interesting decision, uh, but I think the courts did what they do best. They uh, they made a decision, uh, but then they they uh, they they narrowed it down in terms of application. And they let's face it, they they tend to do that on just about everything. So that's all about I have to say on that. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, so before we move on to our next question, just wanted to acknowledge uh, some of our faculty guests. As uh, Dr. Hall pointed out, uh, we were joined by our dean, uh, Dr. David Beek. I'm glad to have you here. Um, in addition, we're also being joined by some of our faculty colleagues. Um, so uh, Dr. Grace Adams Square, the newly minted Dr. Grace Adams Square, I might add, um, is uh, with us, as well as uh, Dr. Julie Lester. Um, and then we also have a, a guest from outside the university who's an esteemed uh, professor of political science as well, Dr. Renan Levine, who is a professor at the uh, University of Toronto at Scarsborough, if I believe correctly. Um, and um, so we're glad to have him here. I think we may have some of his students as well. So um, great to see a, 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 a contingent from, although Renan himself, I don't believe is from originally from north, north of the border, nonetheless, to have a international contingent here um, with us as well. So um, so thank you all for being here. Um, and um, Let's uh, move on to uh, what was originally intended to be, I guess, our first question, um, which is about the uh, the subject matter of this uh, this whole uh, uh, discussion, which is uh, the concept of Super Tuesday, right? So you may have seen that phrase Super Tuesday, and I'm not even been sure what Super Tuesday was. So um, so we stuck it in the title, um, which begs the question: What is it? Um, what is Super Tuesday? And uh, when did it start becoming important in presidential nominations? I don't know, if, uh, Matt, if you wanted to lead off with that one. Oh, uh, sure, Chris. Uh, so, the um, <clears throat> what what Super Tuesday basically is is where a um, a number of states, um, varying numbers depending upon election year, but a, a multiplicity of states hold their national nominating. Um, um, primaries and caucuses and conventions all on the same day, um, all on the same Tuesday. Now, uh, historically, normally it's occurred in the first Tuesday in March, um, but there have been other versions of Super Tuesday that come along. The, uh, the, what it actually responds to um, 
was movements that date back to, well, they really date back as far back as the 50s, uh, where they were first formalized in the the, uh, re- the committee report on American elections that the um, American Political Science um, Association did, and which called back then for a national primary. And so there's long been an idea out there that, that what they what we ought to do is uh, somewhat uh, standardize and centralize and simplify the presidential nominating contest uh, into a single event or a small series of events. So uh, for like a lot of things in politics, that's saying that was thrown out there and nobody really did anything about it for a couple of decades. Uh, but in 1984, um, they, well, during which I will say this, one thing did happen along that way. In the 70s, we moved away from the caucus convention system, which was dominated by the party machines, and towards a more democratized system where the party and the electorate uh, voted directly for the, the delegates in primaries over caucuses and conventions. Um, that was in place in the Democratic Party in 70 by 72 and in the Republican Party by 76. That flash forward to a decade to 1984. 1984, um, the, the, um, that presidential election cycle um, was the first employment of this effort to pile a bunch of states all on one day. And that was the first super that was given by the name by the media, the Super Tuesday. Uh, ever since 84, there's always been some kind of Super Tuesday. Um, and in many elections, there's also been a multiplicity of Super Tuesdays. Actually, believe it or not, in 84, they actually had three. They had Super Tuesday, one, two, and three. But um, that there's been sometimes been called mini Tuesdays. They've had mega Tuesdays. Um, but what it really comes down to is it's just a way of, if you will, how we, we nominate presidential standard bearers is the same as a copy of how we elect presidents electoral college. Now, we elect president electoral college is a state by state elections where the voters select electors who can then come to electoral college and formally elector, elect a president. And that's been in place since 1824. Um, they in the party system, they just copy that. The only difference is you, you pull out the word elector and you put the word delegate in and you pull out the electoral college and you put the national nominating convention in. And so when you vote in the primary, when you come up here in Georgia and you vote in the Georgia primary, what you're doing is you're voting for a slate of electors who have pledged at the first ballot, the first vote at the national nominating convention to vote for their standard bearer. And so when you have a multiplicity of these done, usually in the first Tuesday in March, they call that a Super Tuesday. Yes, we are going to have a Super Tuesday. And yes, it is tomorrow. Uh, Georgia's not involved in that, but I will say this. Uh, Georgia and actually my state as well and Florida are in sort of these follow on Super Tuesdays that sometimes get called mini Tuesdays and stuff. So anyway, basically the prediction right now is pretty much by the end of March, we'll know who the nominee is. That's really what the Super Tuesday does, by the way, is it, it accelerates whoever's the leader in the in the delegate total. It accelerates their march to the uh, to the nomination. And now I'm going to turn this over to John because I've probably spoken more than I should have. No, that was perfect. And you did not leave a lot of holes to fill. Um, I'll look at it more from a a theoretical perspective, uh, just to make sure we all get, which we're teaching in class right now uh, for any of my students here, the process for political parties, picking who they will run for president, for the U.S. Senate, uh, for the U.S. House, even for for state governor, for local representation. Um, The political parties fundamentally make up their own rules regarding how they will select their candidates. and historically, pre-progressive era, um, political parties would pick who they wanted to run for themselves. Uh, however, the progressive era, among the many changes that came from that at the turn of the 20th century, uh, was a push to have primaries. That way, the Democratic Party and the Republican Party don't pick who they're running for office. It allows the people to select who they will run for office. This is one of the reasons, one of the several reasons, why we refer to American political parties as being relatively weak. Uh, compared to many, say, Western European um, allies. Uh, The political parties don't even have the power to select who they will run. That is something that is in the hands of the people. 
Um, and beyond that, Dr. Caverly, you did a fantastic job of describing the rest. Again, Super Tuesday is super simply because there are a lot of elections at the same time. The Republican Party requires a little over 1,200 delegates to win the Republican ticket for president. And on Super Tuesday, uh, over 800 delegates will be available. So that's, you know, in the vicinity of well over two thirds of the required votes are right there on that one day. Uh, for the Democratic Party, it's a little under 2,000 delegates to win the Democratic nomination, and there will be a little over 1,400 delegates on Tuesday. So it's not as if a presidential candidate for the Democratic or Republican Party can win um, the nomination on Super Tuesday by itself, uh, but it's extraordinarily important simply because there are so many states involved. I believe this year we have 16 states and one territory involved tomorrow. And But as Dr. Caverly said, Georgia will be next week, not on Super Tuesday, so make sure to go out and vote. Uh, beyond that, none of these states that are having primaries or caucuses tomorrow are more important than any of the other states. It's just a lot happening on one day. Okay, great, thanks. Um, yeah, and the, just a couple points I would add very briefly. Um, <clears throat> first is, um, as uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Hall notes, right, uh, the uh, the election itself, right, uh, in Georgia is scheduled for the 12th, uh, so uh, a week from tomorrow. Um, early voting is available until Friday um, at various early voting sites. You can check online using your voter registration information on the Secretary of, Website, uh, Secretary of State's website. Uh, to find out where and when you can do that. Um, usually it's in during regular business hours, but um, but check, it's different depending on which county you live in. Um, but there's usually going to be at least one early voting site per county, just so you're aware of that. Although I would not expect terribly high turnout next Tuesday if you do wait and vote on Tuesday. Um, the other thing is um, just to kind of get back in a little bit into the history perhaps, um, just to fill in a little bit of the gap there, right? The, um, 1984 was kind of a turning point uh, for the parties, um, uh, and part of the part of the impetus for Super Tuesday, at the time at least theoretically, uh, was um, to strengthen uh, different factions within the party, um, particularly for the Democrats. So the Democrats, um, Southern Democrats in particular, thought that uh, you know having their uh, coordinating essentially their primary contests for the same day. Uh, would give them an outside influence over um, who was being nominated. Um, it didn't quite work out that way. Certainly in 1984 it didn't, um, but um, but it did eventually, theoretically at least, pay off uh, in 1992 with Bill Clinton. Um, and so, um, so the goal was to sort of, um, I guess, create a, from their perspective, uh, a quote-unquote moderate block of states um, that would nominate um, you know, a, a Democrat who could win in the South, right? Um, you know, today we're talking 40 years later, the geopolitics and all that is a lot different perhaps. Um, and so um, so those considerations may not necessarily be the same for both parties. Um, but nonetheless, you know, we still have the legacy of that. And some of that also bleeds into things like, for example, a lot of those same states that started Super Tuesday also being states that are open primaries, right, where you don't have party registration, things like that, although there's not a complete overlap between the two, but certainly the southern states at the, around the same time were also adopting open primaries in part to try to keep more conservative um, white voters uh, from uh, switching parties and becoming Republicans um, and still having an influence in the Democratic Party. And so um, so I just wanted to note that very briefly before we moved on to the, the next question, because it is a little bit of a, I guess today, a little bit of a historical footnote. Um, but um, but it's also an example of where, you know, uh, you know, our past kind of uh, political development shapes where we go. Right. Um, so speaking of our uh, primary and caucus season so far, um, as anything expected or sorry, unexpected or unusual occurred um, in the primaries and caucuses so far. We've had a few caucuses as well. Um, and um, should we expect anything unusual or unexpected either tomorrow or uh, perhaps in some of the upcoming contests? I'm guessing this is um, going to be a short one. <laughs> uh, great question there. Uh, this could take the rest of the month. 
Um, in terms of what has happened unexpected or unusual so far in the primary and caucus season, I would have to point to the multiple trials that have been going on uh, for former President Donald Trump. One of the more important opinions that went in his favor, obviously, we discussed earlier, and that was the simple fact uh, that the Supreme Court uh, removed uh, state government's uh, belief that they could enforce the 14th Amendment at the federal level. Uh, going forward, we also have uh, additional uh, trials at the federal and state level uh, that will also make this an extraordinarily unique election. Um, if I were a Republican political strategist, I would be most concerned, I would think, about the Georgia trial uh, in terms of election tampering, mainly due to the fact that there's actual video, uh, excuse me, audio evidence there. Um, so in terms of what has been odd so far, I would say that it would be the fact that the the judiciary is playing such a prominent role in the electoral process during an election year. Uh, in terms of, and again, we could talk more about the oddities uh, even beyond that. I just wanted to limit myself to that because it's such an unprecedented uh, series of events with a, a prominent, not only presidential candidate, but former president who has several um, pending trials that have been complete and those in the future. Uh, in terms of Anything unexpected or unusual in tomorrow's contests, um, I don't necessarily see anything that would go beyond a normal electoral cycle. Uh, we can always have uh, close uh, elections, and I think this will obviously be a close election. But in terms of the primaries, uh, I think that we will see uh, President, former President Trump sweeping uh, all of the states tomorrow for the Republican ticket. And I think we will see current President Biden sweeping all of the elections. Now, keep in mind, I don't want us to limit the conversation to just presidents. To remind all of the students here, the president is running for re-election. Uh, we have presidential primaries, but we also have all 435 members of the House that are up for re-election. We have one third of the U.S. Senate that's up for re-election, not to mention the many state and local elections that are ongoing. So there could be a number of surprising um, events that occur tomorrow. Uh, I would like to think that the most surprising will be a high voter turnout, but um, that would be my optimistic uh, expectation for tomorrow. More voters than we would expect. On that, I will leave this to Dr. Caverly and uh, to Dr. Lawrence to fill in. Uh, okay, well, I, I, um, I, I think it's, uh, it's, uh, I don't know about, um, in, in a, it's not really an oddity. It's more of a similarity, but it, but it, it's an oddity in the absolute sense. It's uh, on the Republican side. So you had uh, yet you some you've had somewhat of a repeat performance of 2016 um, in, in this sense. So in, in 16, uh, uh, then Mr. Trump, you know, he comes down the escalator at the Trump Tower. And and uh, in, in all honesty, I, I think a lot of the Republican Party thought he was a bit of a joke. Uh, and um, and you had all of these, you know, 10,000 and one half uh, people running for president uh, at, in a, on the Republican side back in 16, and, uh, and uh, Trump beat them all. Um, uh, and uh, it was funny about, about that particular election because, uh, you know, it started out Jeb Bush was the front runner, and a month later, Trump, after he announced he was the front runner, and he never lost it. Well, flash forward, we had the the 2020 stuff and uh and now we're in 2024 an interesting phenomena is we've had somewhat of a repeat you know trump trump is making a comeback and uh and uh he had a whole stew pot full of republicans uh uh who uh who came out against him and uh and uh, there's nothing against ambassador haley i know she's still in the game but uh but um um he took it out all the rest of them and uh and uh, i mean unless something well, honestly, I think it's approaching a point where she needs a miracle um, um, to overcome the the current trend line. But uh, so that's that's not a that's not a um, it's unusual in the sense that it's been a it's been a kind of a repeat performance, and that's been uh, that 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 was surprising to me. I, I have to say, uh, um, uh, and I, the the Democratic side uh, has uh, is. Um, not been surprising at all, and again, it's nothing against Congressman Phillips or or uh, um, uh, Ms. Williamson, but uh, 
but the reality is that uh, uh, neither one of them probably had much of a chance, and and they're kind of showing that, um, you know. So it's uh, uh but I I agree with uh, I agree with uh, Professor Hall the uh, the the role of the uh, of these court cases. Uh, now that is odd. That that's that's a very unique thing. I mean, we don't uh, you know we we had a uh, uh, we we had a guy who ran for president from a jail cell, Eugene V. Debs. Uh, but he had he got busted for speaking out against the World War One draft, and they they locked him up. And he ran. For, he was kind of one of those perennial. There's people out there that run for president every year for like twenty and thirty years, and so he was one of those guys. Uh, and uh, he was the head of a, of one of America's socialist parties. And uh, so anyway, he literally ran for president from a jail cell. But it it wasn't that it wasn't that big of a deal. Um, but this one here, uh, and we have a president who's looks like he's going to go to criminal trial. Now, it may not happen in this presidential cycle, but that's a that's it. We've never had anything like that. And so in that sense, that's a that's a uh, that's it. We also have going on right now on the other side. Uh, we have the whole Hunter Biden stuff. And uh, and, um, you know, there's a there's a chance. Um, the current sitting president, Joe Biden, now, I, I don't think there's any shot at all he'll have any conviction in the Senate, but there's a chance that the Republican House might just impeach him. I mean, they're doing an impeachment inquiry on him. We're, and So we got to, we, and he's running against, a, or his challenger is a guy who was impeached not once but twice. So we might have a, a, a one-time impeached guy against a two-time impeached guy all in the same election. Now that I will say, that's a that's a those are that's a pretty unique event in American history. Or it's the harbinger of things to come, which I hope it's not, because that's a that's going to lead our politics to a very very dark place. And I hope that that doesn't happen. But uh, so that that little stuff there was a little bit funny, but but uh, that that's not funny at all. That uh, that dark place because we we went down that road once this country, and we don't ever want to do that again. Um, that war, that war killed almost a million Americans. We don't ever want to do that again. But anyway, um, um, on, on that, on that rather pessimistic note, I'm going to sign off there. <laughs> Great point. Uh, Dr. Cavley, phenomenal. I, I, uh, enjoyed and agree with everything that you said there. I wanted, it, something hit me, I believe in terms of what has unique, what's unique that's happened also, but not tomorrow. I uh, believe that, uh, former governor Nikki Haley did win, uh, the district of Columbia's primary. So that was relatively interesting uh, but i agree with you that she is definitely out of this i think and i think she will bow out after tomorrow uh one other point i noticed and this is to all the students while i have told my students that you do not have to uh, ask questions or take part i noticed that the chat is quite quiet uh so please uh, i encourage all of you if you have any questions on the extraordinarily important 2024 election either at the federal state or local level Please shoot those over to us in the chat. Thank you all for making the uh, pitch that I was about to make. Um, so, um, but I would add uh, one more thing uh, that is unusual. I think is you know just the fact that we have a rematch of the same presidential election we had last time, right? That's not happened since what the 1950s, right? So, um, you know, and that was obviously before you know the primary era as we know it today, right? So a very different time when the quote unquote smoke filled rooms were. Uh, very much in still in contention for deciding who the nominees were going to be and that sort of thing. So, um, so it is worth noting that um, you know uh, there was an old saying that there are no second acts in American politics, but um, you know Donald Trump is definitely trying to challenge that uh, old saying. Um, we'll see if he can be successful or not over the next few months. Um, but he definitely at least is getting to the final round, it would seem. Um, so, so speaking of the final round, uh, or the next round, if you will, right? Um, so we we've already said that the next uh, next primary really up um, is going to be next week uh, with us here in Georgia. Um, and in fact, uh, both uh, uh, President Biden and former President Trump are expected to campaign here in the next week. I was reading that earlier today um, in advance of our primary. Um, even if both primaries are essentially decided already, right? Everybody sort of. I guess it's taken for granted uh, that uh, Trump is going to prevail in the Republican side and that Biden is going to prevail on the Democrat side. Um, why would they be coming here and going to all that trouble if it's already kind of a foregone conclusion that 
both of them are going to win. Uh, it seems like a poor campaign strategy at some level, unless there's something I'm missing, which I'm maybe missing for rhetorical purposes. Great question there, Chris. I didn't want to jump in front of you, Matt. Um, there's two ways of looking at this. If we know that President, former President Trump will win Georgia and current President Biden will win Georgia for their respective tickets, why are they doing it? Uh, you can look at it from one perspective of why are they actually doing it? Why are their parties doing it? Why are we having this? Uh, and obviously, if you go back for all of my students, we've covered this. Article six of the U.S. Constitution requires of the states that they create that they provide a Republican form of government. So there is no choice. We actually have to have these elections in terms of the primary elections. Why bother? Again, from the perspective of their political parties, there is no choice. We They have to have a primary election in the state of Georgia and the rest of the states, except those who use caucuses. Um, and they're not just running for this particular primary. President Trump is not just running in Georgia for the Republican nomination. President Biden is not running in Georgia right now just for the Rep Democratic nomination. They're running for the general election in November. So there's never a bad time to campaign. Georgia, it has become one of the most important swing states in the Republic, meaning that it can go Republican or Democrat. So while the Republican Party primary and the Democratic Party primary in Georgia are foregone conclusions, uh, they are campaigning for the long haul. They're looking at the long game. That's the way I would look at that. And from a non-presidential perspective, we have to remember all 14 representatives from the House of Representatives representing Georgia are up for re-election. So that, those elections are still very much in play. We don't have a senatorial uh, election in Georgia coming up, but the primary elections, even though they are foregone conclusions in terms of the results, the campaigning, I would argue is definitely for the November general election in this incredibly important state. Oh uh, yeah, I, I don't really have uh, anything to add uh, of, of any real substance on that. Just, I mean, we we have these again. The we've got the Georgia's important because we got the court case here, and that's that's a criminal case, and that's you know, I, again, I can't emphasize I can't emphasize enough how unusual that is and how impactful that could be uh, on on uh, not just this election, but on governing and, you know, governing in general. I mean, especially, you know, if the former president wins, um, you know, what's going to happen with this? Uh, that that's an, that's we've never we've we've really never been around this, down this road before. Uh, I mean, you know, I guess sort of in a way we had a we had a guy who had been vice president who got in trouble for being in, involved in a in a traitorous activity that was Aaron Burr, but uh, but that was actually after he left office and he wasn't running for office anymore. But, um, uh, you know, I, I don't know what's going to happen within that. Um, um, the uh, the and and as just to just to um, pile on a little bit of what uh, what uh, Dr. Hall just said on the listen, Georgia is um, Georgia is a is a big state in terms of population. And it's a competitive state in statewide elections. Uh, if a Democrat can really amp out turnout in the major municipal areas, one of those, by the way, is Macon. Um, uh, but the big one, of course, is Atlanta. But, you know, you could also think Columbus and you could think Savannah uh, and you could think Augusta. You know, a Democrat, if a Democrat can get enough there, they can flip the state. Uh, and that's what Joe Biden did in 2020. Uh, and he might do it again. Uh, by the same token, um, in the rural areas of Georgia, man, it's ruby red, like right, right, you know, where I'm at here in Bleckley County. I mean, we're we're as Republican as you can get, and uh, and if you can if you can max out turnout, you know, the old the old adage, the old political scientists, they used to say, well, the rural, you know, rules and realities are in decline, and their their you know turnout, you know, it's, it's they just don't matter that much anymore. You know, one thing about Donald Trump showed in uh, 2016, but especially in 2020, even though he lost, he showed that you can really ramp up numbers in, in those areas. And uh, and uh, that that proved a lot of us poli sci types wrong, quite frankly. And uh, and um, so he could do that again. Well, we, we could have a really high voter turnout. I mean, I would think this is a, um, you know, as as Chris pointed out, this is the last time we, we haven't had a rematch since 1956. 
Uh, and the last time, you know, we had a former president um, who really, I mean, who made it in the general election. Now we had, form, you know, Herbert Hoover tried to win the Republican nomination again, and he didn't. He didn't achieve that. But, um, but the 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 last, you know, and and back in the, you know, when I was a kid, they used to talk about Jerry Ford trying to make a comeback back in 1980. But uh, that that didn't happen either. But um, you know, you really have to you really have to go back a long way. So we got to start talking about Teddy Roosevelt, nineteen twelve. Uh, so uh, so it's going to be exciting. I mean, it, regardless of what happened. But Georgia's uh, Georgia's a big deal. Georgia's a player, uh, not just in presidential politics, but across the board. Uh, how Georgia goes goes the nation. Uh, in many respects, Georgia helped put Joe Biden in the White House. And in many respects, if it goes the other way, Georgia could help put Donald Trump back in uh, or, or whatnot. I mean, it, it's a really big deal. That's why those of you that are out here that are watching that are Georgians, you should really pay attention because you're you you matter. I mean, you matter a bit. Now, we could talk about, well, is that really fair? You know, is that fair to the good folks of Massachusetts who we know going in already that if the Democrats ran Mickey frickin' Mouse, Massachusetts is going to go for Mickey Mouse. Uh, they, they're going to run Joe Biden, and, and that election's already over in Massachusetts. Um, and so you could argue, well, from a Democratic theory perspective, it is fair that Georgia effectively in a presidential election matters more than Massachusetts, because uh, we know the way Massachusetts is going to go. Um, by the same, by the same token, you know, Alabama, our, our good friends over there in Alabama, and you know, I know Dr. Hall went to school there in Alabama. But, you know, listen, Al Donald Trump or whoever, the, the Republican Party, it didn't matter who the Republican Party ran. And in today's politics, just as in the old days, it would have been a Southern Democrat. But in today's politics, look, Al Al Joe Biden hasn't got a ghost chance in heaven, hell or any world in between in the good state of Alabama. Uh, but is it really fair to Alabamans if you really think about that compared to Georgia? We matter in a way that they don't. We, we determine elections that, in a way that they don't. That's just something to think about anyway on there. I've rambled on too long. I apologize. Matt, that's a great point. Um, and we've covered this in class. Again, I keep referencing that. Uh, you make a great point that some states, swing states, are, I want to say, quote unquote, more important than others. I would look at it from this perspective. They're important because we don't yet know which direction they will go. It's not as if the nine electoral votes in Alabama don't matter as much as the 16. Think of it. This is a metaphor I'm making up on the fly, so please forgive me if this does not work out. Think of a football game. Is the fourth quarter more important than the first quarter? I would argue, of course not. But if you're in the fourth quarter and you already know what happened in the first, the second, and the third, well, then the fourth quarter seems more important. But I'm going to work that metaphor out a little bit more later. But, um, but great point. Georgia is definitely, from that perspective, exponentially more important than states with even states with more electoral votes like California that we know which direction they're going to go but great points okay, okay thanks a lot so um we have a couple of questions from the chat um so our uh, first question uh is um, by the way i'm not going to address the one that we did address the at the very beginning um which both uh, dr cavalier and i were able to address um but we do have a question uh, from actually Dr. Adam Square, uh, who notes that uh, you know there are 16 states on Super Tuesday. Goal for the Republicans they need 1,200 delegates. If uh, Nikki Haley does stay in past Super Tuesday, can she make a significant impact? Or with the ch court challenges you uh, have identified, is it wise still for her to stay in as a likely replacement, error presumptive, uh, in the event that uh, Trump, for whatever reasons, is unable to? um become the nominee i don't know if either I'll, of you want to I'll, I'll i'll do you want to jump in john or yeah. okay well so i i would say uh um so i would say you have to think about something here one remember that um the convention is actually where they officially mint the nominee that's where they choose the nominee. And in fact, before the modern um, primary system that, again, goes back to 76 for the Republicans, 72 for the Democrats, the convention overwhelmingly is that's where it was decided. 
um, because nobody had the would have the delegate support going in. There'd usually somebody who was leading and the convention would wheel and deal and they'd work or they work things out. So let's say that um, uh, President Trump derails somewhere along the way. Uh, and we go to the convention and we have a brokered convention. A brokered convention is just a term where there's nobody has a lead. Well, at that point, now remember, if the only person that is there, that is Ambassador Haley, you might say, well, now, wait a minute, won't everybody will just go to Haley? Well, here's the thing on that. They don't have to. And you have to ask yourself the question. If you have all these people who had supported Trump over Haley, would they switch at that point? Or would they go to a somebody who never said anything bad about Trump? And because at that point, it could be anybody. At that point, they could resurrect DeSantis. They could go grab Tim Scott. They could they could pull him. I mean, we've had stuff like this happen. I mean, that's how we got uh, that's how we got Polk. And that was an old election back in 1844. But the Democrats couldn't figure out who to nominate. And so after I think was the 40 some ballot or something like that, they they came up with uh, with uh, with Polk. We've had this kind of thing. In other words, um, would would pe I think it would ask a question? Um, would people change their support? Um, you know, I think she might make a a strong run in a brokered convention, but I don't know if she could overtake because you could easily choose somebody else, and they might choose a somebody else. Um, you know, I mean, you could even think they might resurrect some old you know unifier or something like. That. They might grab Jeb Bush or somebody. Um, so they, in other words, what I'm saying is that you wouldn't have to take the number two be, uh, because once you go to the convention, that's where you officially nominate somebody. You don't have to nominate whoever came in second place. If it's a brokered convention, it can be somebody that never ran. I mean, it could be as long as they met the qualifications, you know, I could go in there and I could put up John Hall and he could be he could be the nominee. I'd vote for him. Thank you. I, I agree completely with everything you said there. Um, I, I do think it's important to note that you, and you mentioned if President Trump derails, the only thing I think that would derail President Trump would be something from one of these court cases. Cannot stress this enough. If I'm a Republican strategist, I am terrified of the Georgia elections tampering case. That's what would scare me the most. So with the exception of a conviction uh, in a criminal trial that would derail anyone's hopes of becoming a president from literal prison, um, there is absolutely no way that President Trump does not win the Republican ticket in a landslide. Um, but yeah, I agree with, uh, I love what you pointed out there. After that first ballot, especially, um, it's anyone's ball game and any predictions, I wouldn't make a single prediction uh, of what the Republican convention would do from a second ballot onward if President Trump had been somehow removed. That would be A, terrifying and B, fun to watch at the same time as a political scientist. Yeah, the only thing I would add is, uh, and this also alludes to a question that we got in the chat, um, you know, just because the president is in jail or the potential presidential nominee is in jail or even in prison, um, whether we're talking about federal jail, state jail, whatever, um, that does not necessarily disqualify them from running for office or even taking office. Um, so there, although this is not precedented, um, you know, it is entirely within the scope of the Constitution, at least, to envision the idea that Inauguration Day rolls around and uh, they got to go and bail the president out of, uh, you know, um, federal prison to bring him to Washington to swear him in as president. Um, now, um, is that realistic? Who knows? Um, I mean, I think that there we're in what I would say are fairly unprecedented times. And we're also in a situation where, um, although certainly the opinion polls suggest that um, President Trump would lose a lot of his support if he were convicted of a crime, um, those opinion polls are opinion polls, right? Um, you know, when you clap, uh, when, when when reality shows up, um, and that's the actual scenario. We'll see how many of them, those people actually follow through and stop supporting him. Um, you know, my suspicion is a lot of people say they would um, 
not support him anymore. And then what we'll find is that, like in a lot of cases, people are just rationalizing decisions that they've already made, right? So, for example, you know, I think if you asked people, you know, eight years ago, if it came out that, you know, Trump had engaged in various types of sexual misconduct with, you know, um, you know, rape and things like that, that they would not support him anymore. And yet the vast majority of people that um, said those things um, that were going to vote for him before still end up voting for him. So, um, you know, and there's always, you know, like I said, the post hoc justification of, well, you know, it was a prosecution witch, witch hunt or, you know, the Biden administration's out to get him or Fannie Willis is out to get him or whatever. Right. So, um, so that's the one caveat I would say about uh, about any sort of um, replacement of Trump. I mean, I think at the this point, right, you almost have to think that it would have to be a a a disability more than anything else. Right. A physical or um, mental disability that just simply preclude him from being able to run effectively. Right. I don't, I don't think even a political disability would be sufficient at this point. Now, you you know, you can disagree with me on that if you want. Um, but but I think that's, you know, kind of the realm of the sort of thing that would probably realistically be the only kind of obstacle at this point, in which case it would open it up to questions of, you know, do you go back and revive Ron DeSantis or um, I do mean revive in the, the broadest sense of the term. Um, let's see. Um, so we have another question. Um this presidential election would involve an incumbent president, a former president. What are your opinions on who would on who would win this election? Uh, can, it's kind of a run on. Uh, consider the odds are in favor of Biden or. Um, I mean, I, I guess we could start with right. what sort of things would make us think the odds are in favor of Biden and what sort of things would make us think that perhaps they would be in, in favor of Trump here. Great question. Uh, the. The part of the question regarding uh, President Biden being favored, that's not really reflected in the polls right now. And again, polls this early in an election year are just that. They're just polls early in election year. Um, but as of right now, I believe the last thing I saw from the last poll I saw, I don't think it was Gallup. I believe it was yep, Gallup uh, has pres uh, former President Trump up by almost three percentage points. Uh, so as of now, and for several months that I've been watching, former President Trump is a couple of points above current President Biden, but that's within the margin of error. So that's neither here nor there. In a close election, if you're asking who would win Georgia, was that the question? I think the question was just generally who would win overall, not necessarily oh, Georgia. I've got a great answer to that. I have no idea. Uh, this is going to be a shockingly close election, just like 2020, just like 2016. Um, there are no words that I have to express to everyone hearing this. Please go vote. Regardless of who you vote for, please go vote, because this is going to be a nail biter. Driven a great deal by, again, the state of Georgia. I agree with everything John just said. This is this this is uh, this is going to be a. Uh, um, it's possible that this could wind up being a, a a record breaker in terms of its closeness. I mean, it's that it's that it's that tight. I mean, these uh these guys are are I mean they're when, whenever so for those of you who haven't had st your statistics course yet, when you say that a, a an outcome is within the um the the margin of error, what that means is that you can't make an accurate prediction. So in the poll, it might say, well, uh, Trump is up by two points, but the margin of error is three points. Well, that means that in reality, he might actually be down by two points. Um, and that's assuming that they did everything right in the poll and uh, and they don't always do everything right. Uh, um, but if you if you, scientific polling, by the way, I just want to say something here. Uh, scientific polling, I'm not, talk, not talking about push polling, I'm not what, talking about what the a lot of you know campaign advertising to advertisers do, but actual scientific polling, for the most part, is pretty good. I mean, it, it's uh, it's a uh, um, it's yeah. Uh, you know, what you need in a, to make a poll accurate is uh, you have to have a certain number of respondents in the sample, um, 
and the sample has to be representative of the population. Uh, and as long as you have random um, assignment uh, and and uh, random treatment, uh, uh, you're going to get an outcome that you can make a pretty accurate prediction. Believe it or not, you only need a sample size if it's appropriately gathered of about 1,500 people, and you can say something about the country as a whole. Uh, that's the advantage of, of, of polling. Now, people say, well, that sounds like magic. It's not magic. It's just math. It's probability theory. Uh, it's, it's a classic bell curve. Things occur along a bell curve. Uh, there's, a, there's a mound that appears in the middle, and there's two tails that go off for the extremes. Uh, that is a for good, bad, or indifferent reasons. If you take your course in physics, what they're going to tell you is that probabilities are an aspect of the the structure of the universe as we um, can render it. Uh, so that that's all that is. It's just tapping into something that's already there, which is just mathematical probability. If you flip a coin um enough times and go back and add it up you'll get about an equal number of halves uh, of heads to an equal number of tails that will always happen no matter what uh that's a pro that's a law of uh, that's a law of mathematics that's a law of physics uh it's just an application to it that's how it works so that's probability as long as you've done it right you can say a lot with polls unfortunately as john has just pointed out here if their end result is well we don't really know then the prediction that you have to make from that end result is we don't really know, which is what he just told you. Uh, and that's where we're at right now. Yeah, the only thing I would add to, to that is, uh, I think it was a very good explanation to like the probability theory and things like that behind it is, um, and, and that's why you know you can't really extrapolate much from a statistical tie, right? Um, I mean, there is a narrow lead, but you know, is that, I mean, you know, is there some systematic error? Is there, you know, we just don't know, right? Um, but the one thing we we do know, right, is that there are certain factors that tend to go into, you know, incumbents getting reelected, right? So, um, so I think if you kind of want to say, okay, well, what what sort of things would you look for if you were expecting the incumbent to win, right? Um, you'd want to look at, you know, stay the economy, right? You know, is the economy getting better? Um, is um you know unemployment getting better um you know those are kind of the traditional macroeconomic indicators right is consumer sentiment which is more of a you know loosey-goosey perhaps indicator but nonetheless is an important one um you know you're gonna look at that um you know you um i mean the there's a very strong historical trend um that you know the state of the economy about this far out from the election is what kind of seems to drive presidential election choice, right? So if you're looking at, okay, you know, if I, my best indicator of what's going to happen six months from now is probably things like the state of the economy, right? As opposed to those, again, those opinion polls, because they're so close, yes, it could go either way, but on the balance, right? Um, you know, but then again, um, you know, you also have to consider that you have, you know, two groups of voters that are very locked in, they're probably not going to be persuaded. And so, you know, it really kind of is going to come down to two things, right? Um, you know, motivation, you know, who who is more motivated to vote um, and mobilized. And then uh, to some extent, po uh, po um, um, persuasion, right? Um, you know, there are some persuadable voters out there. Um, there are people that live under a rock, believe it or not, that don't pay attention to politics all the time. Um, they could go either way. Um, and so, you know, those are your kind of, you know, the two kind of wild cards here is, you know, how do, how well can Trump and Biden mobilize their bases, um, and how well can those two campaigns persuade them, the other voters, right, either to vote for them or not vote for the other guy, right? Um, the, the, I mean, that, the, you know, that sounds kind of very simplistic and oversimplistic, perhaps, but that's kind of how elections work is, you know, that that mobilization plus uh, persuasion equation. How's that for a run? Um, so um, speaking of uh, mobilization and and uh, um, the other one, um, <laughs> uh, persuasion, right? Um yeah, we haven't talked much about issues, but somebody does have a question about the issues. Um, 
you know, the media says we should talk more about issues. So we'll talk about issues. Um, so um, Seth asks, uh, how do you all think the Texas border situation will affect the election or even if it will have an actual effect? Great question. Um, that is definitely one of the more important policy areas right now, especially if you have any interest uh, in the survival of, let's say, Ukraine as a nation state. That in, in the past, it was tied in directly to that. The, the border issue, um, in terms of federal legislation reforming the U.S. border, particularly the border between the United States and Mexico, uh, this has been an issue in American national politics for decades. Uh, regardless of your political persuasion, you could probably make the argument that the federal government has not necessarily succeeded in providing uh, concise and effective uh, border reform. Um, as it stands today, uh, it really depends on your perspective. The If you follow this issue, uh, former President Donald Trump, who has an extraordinary amount of influence over the current Republican Party, has repeatedly stressed his desire for the for the U.S. House, which is controlled by the Republicans, to not pass border reform. And you might wonder, why is that? This is nothing against or for the former president. This is just politics. If there is a problem with the border that gets fixed during the fourth year of President Biden's first term in office, President Biden will effectively get a great deal of credit for having solved a horrifying problem on the border. So if the border patrol, if the border issue is not solved, then that's something that President Trump will be able to run on in this election. So again, that's not a, a negative or a positive. That's just a neutral political reality. If there's a problem that is not solved by the incumbent, the challenger can run on that problem. Having said that, I don't think it will necessarily sway the election one way or another because, as Dr. Lawrence mentioned, there are so many uh, voters that were entrenched in the Biden camp or the Trump camp. Um, I do think maybe it could encourage a few more people to go out and vote. So I don't necessarily think it will sway someone's vote. I think the biggest effect it might have, if any, is its effect on voter turnout. Um, but other than that, uh, the Biden administration obviously has a great deal of interest in solving this particular issue, at least appearing to solve it now. And the Trump um, campaign has an active interest in making sure this is not necessarily solved now so that he can campaign on it. And I'll leave it for everyone else to jump in on that. Uh, the only thing that I, I, I would add is that if you think about it this way, uh, uh, whoever, whichever one of these guys wins the turnout fight on election night or, you know, across the election period, that's the one that's going to win. Uh, and uh, that's another thing right now, uh, going back to the previous question, we don't know who's going to win that, who's going to win that fight right now. Um, but uh, the, the border uh, issue can stimulate turnout positively or negatively within both camps. Now, then the question does, do they do they um, balance each other out and then effectively doesn't really change? Or does it does the turnout affect from a, something like the border issue or any other single issue uh, pr uh, promote one side or the other? However, that's going to happen uh, will help determine who wins on election night. But again, I say that right now. Uh, it's it's a difficult thing um, uh, as as to that that turnout because there are I will say this is not across a wide span of issues both President Biden and former President Trump have some potential issue problems that will impact turnout among their own base um, now they they tend to be different issues so for Trump it it could be something like uh, the abortion issue, uh, which has tended to uh, hurt him, particularly among um, um, women and, uh, and independents. But the border issue has had some impact uh, on uh, Joe Biden's core uh, constituency. Um, some of the the sort of the the uh, um, er, the uh, uh, working class voters. Uh, have uh, have reacted neg negatively uh, to Biden on um, on the uh, border. Uh, there's also a uh, I see somebody has has put up in the chat 
um, related to the Israeli Hamas uh, war. Uh, that has had an impact not just among um, among certain voters, among voter constituencies within the Democratic Party. Uh, and um, so if the, uh, uh, the the question is about young voters, but it's, it's not just young voters, but it's also uh, Arab and Muslim voters and stuff on that particular issue. But within the border issue, uh, in the, you know, one of the, there, there used to be an argument um, out there in terms of, of uh, race and, and ethnic vote studies people. Uh, they used to say this, whoever wins the Hispanic vote at the end of the day is going to be a nationally dominant party will have a realignment. It'll go one way or the other, whoever gets the Hispanics. See, right now, uh, historic, the Republicans have done well among Cubans, and the Democrats have done well among um, uh, Chicanos, Puerto Ricans, uh, and uh, more recent um, Hispanics. However, however, beginning as far back as the Mitt Romney campaign back in 2012, there has been a movement among Hispanics writ large a bit away from the Democrats and towards the Republicans. There has also, and this goes back to Obama uh, in 08, there has been a movement on the other side among Cuban voters, young Cuban voters, away from the Republicans toward the Democrats. So we have that going on, but that's an, that's an example and a big issue that the the big issue there was Cuba, but I mean, this the movement of Hispanics in general involves the the border. Uh, so there, there's a there's a lot of these issue voters uh, can can be an impact. You got to understand something. If enough people stay home in Michigan, Trump will win Michigan because because Biden will lose them if enough people stay home uh, in Michigan, and it doesn't take much. Um, if if uh, you know. 20,000 people stay home that otherwise would have turned out. There's a good shot that Trump that Trump uh, flips Michigan back to the red uh, or something like that. Uh, so this could easily happen either way. So, again, this is going to come down to turnout and the issues are very much pushing that. You get it. Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> so I want to um, uh, kind of piggyback off of uh, Ariel's question. Um, he also asked about, um, in addition to the uh, Israel-Gaza thing, which we could talk about if we want to, um, but he also emphasized something that we were going to uh, talk about, um, which is um, age, right? Um, so both, um, obviously, both candidates are old uh, by any relative term, I think, certainly relative to any a former president, uh, they're both uh, way up there. Um, so even though both are fairly advanced in age, um, nonetheless, um, it seems like from the opinion polls and certainly a piece I was reading in the New York Times this week that um, Biden's age seems to be more of a liability with voters than Trump's, even though they're only about four years apart. Um, with Trump being in his late 70s and Biden, of course, being 81. Um, why why does the age issue seem to be affecting Biden more than Trump here, um, even though perhaps certainly a lot of people have argued that. Trump, if anything, has shown more visible signs of um, physical and mental decline. I'll jump on this one. That's a great question. Um, again, we need to recognize that we one of the unique elements of this and the last presidential election is the fact that we have the oldest candidates we have ever had. Uh, the oldest candidate elected president was President Donald Trump in 2016. President Biden broke that record in 2020, um, and somebody's going to the way President Biden wins, he'll break it again in 2024. Um, so President Biden's 81. Former President Trump is 77. They're both old. So why does President Biden appear to be getting more, I would say, negative press regarding age and President Trump doesn't? A lot of it has to do with one simple fact. President Biden is the president. Uh, there is no position on the planet Earth with the level of visibility of an American president. They are one could argue from a secular perspective, the most powerful human being on the planet. So that very simple fact, the fact that President Biden is currently in office gives him more um, gives him more press that in regarding his current age. Now, another 
interesting variable has to do with the fact that it's it's actually split between the party's voters. Uh, one of the main reasons that President Biden seems to have more public concern regarding his age is because Democratic voters have more concern. If you poll, when polled, uh, Republican voters have almost, and it, it's extraordinary, the consistency here, Republican voters across the board just do not seem to care at all that President, former President Trump is 77. When asked, that is one of the least significant things to Republican voters. When polled, Democratic voters do have concerns. So there in the math, you can see why President Biden is getting a little bit more negative press because of his age. And that's because his base, the Democratic voters are concerned, while Republican voters have such a level of support for former President Trump, they really just don't care, at least in the polling. Uh, so those are some of the major variables at play. Also, when you look at their style, this is something that's hard to operationalize, but former President Trump is, how do I put it? He's a more, he has a different debate style. He has a different speaking style. He has a much more aggressive speaking style compared to President Biden, who has more of a traditional speaking style for American presidents. And that in and of itself could also lead some to believe that he is more energetic, not necessarily because he is more energetic, but that's how he speaks. Um, but again, yeah, those are the main reasons that I would think President Biden gets a little bit more negative press for age when both President Biden and President Trump are so close in age, it really doesn't matter. They are both what we would consider old. That's very good. I I I think that that's that that's right on. Uh, the only thing I I would add is as uh, a couple of things. One is this: uh, Joe Biden has um, has a speech impediment. Um, he's a stutterer, and when he gets um, when he gets tired, and when he gets um, um, you know a bit excited. Um, you can you can hear that come out, and that comes out often as gaffes. And of course, as uh, as uh, Professor Hall pointed out there, you know when a when a president, you know when a president does anything, uh, everybody hears about it, no matter what. Um, and the um, the uh, if you if you watch them, um, uh, you'll see that uh, um, President Biden um, is, has a slower gait when he walks and stuff and moves than Trump does. And so that can also somewhat give the image of, of well, he's a teetering old man about to fall over dead um, relative to Trump. Um, and the, uh, the other thing I would say is that um, there, there's a one of the great bifurcations in American politics is the young versus the old. And traditionally, the old has always went with the more conservative party, which is in this case is the Republican Party, and the young with more the more Dem the Democratic Party. Uh, and so, um, because there's there is there are more young people make up a larger coalition, uh, a larger proportion of the coalition that is the Democratic Party than they do the Republican Party. Um, you, you're going to have a, a deeper look, if you will, about age, because one of the things about young people that they do is they do the same thing that older people. Older people criticize young people and young, younger people criticize older people. Um, and so that there's that phenomena is, is possibly also playing itself out uh, in the in the polling and so on and so forth and the focus groups and whatnot on that. Um, but the, the, the reality is, you know, I, there's also a wonderful, um, I'm about to kill some of the political scientists out there, but uh, um, there are at least aspects of politics, behavioral politics that are illogical, if not fully irrational. Uh, so it's because here, here's the thing. If you say, if you say Joe's too old, then if you're being logical, what you have to conclude is that Trump is also too old. But people don't do that. And people do stuff like that all the time. Uh, 
Um, and so uh, that's one of the great criticisms that always leveled against rational choice theory was, well, yeah, but in reality, people actually do do contradictions and stuff like that. But uh, uh, so that that's one of them right there. Uh, and some of that is, um, I mean, what are you going to do? I mean, there, there isn't anybody else there. I mean, unless, again, Ambassador Haley can unseat Trump or and Congressman Phillips or Ms. Williamson can somehow unseat uh, Biden. But I mean, I don't I don't see how that's going to happen. Uh, and of course, if we get a broker convention, remember, I've always thrown my hat in the ring for uh, for uh, Dr. Hall there. So I'm going to be his campaign manager and we're going to we're going to we're going to take this thing by storm. So I'll turn that over. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, uh, yeah, the first point is, I, I mean, I think I, I would agree that, you know, like you said before, um, you know, people will rationalize anything. Um, and so, um, you know, that that's always a possibility here. I mean, I think uh, another thing to consider here is that, um, and, and, and I hate to say it in a, in a negative way because it's not really a negative, but you could argue that Trump, by having to campaign, has put himself a little bit more visibly out there and therefore been able to dispel maybe a little bit of the idea that he's old, um, even though in some ways he hasn't. Um, whereas, you know, if you're Biden and you're not, I mean, you're basically not campaigning, right, um, more or less. Um, you don't have serious opposition, so you're not going out there and doing the same level of campaign activity, right? Um, then that's just going to be perceived, I think, as, um, you know, um, you know, a, a lack of participation. Uh, and it's hard to perceive, you know, it's hard to perceive vigor if there's no vigor on display, right? Um, and so, you know, if, you, if all you're doing is friendly interviews and things like that, that's not what's going to demonstrate to the public that you're kind of on the ball, right? Um, now, if we, you know, as we transition to more of a general election campaign, as we transition to, you know, making more public appearances and, you know, being kind of compared in the moment, um, perhaps Biden can capitalize on that, right? Um, I mean, not to be his campaign manager or anything, but it seems to me that, you know, uh, the the Rose Garden uh, basement strategy, whatever we, we might call it, um, isn't really working for him. Um, and, um, and I think, you know, I think Biden realizes that, I think he knows that, right? But at the same time, you know, why go into that too early if you don't need to, right? Is the, and so, I mean, I think the, going back to our earlier question about why, why is Biden coming to Georgia? Um, you know, I think that's maybe part of this is, okay, we're, we're rolling out the real campaign now, right? It's, you know, it's basically settled. We know it's down to Trump. We know Haley is a non-factor. We know that um, you know the he's gotten past his biggest speed bump in Michigan, presumably as far as Biden's concerned, right? Because that turned into a nothing burger, and so you know, you know, there he's the presumptive nominee. Um, and again, unless he wants to do something about that, right? Then nobody's really in a position to tell him no, right? So, um, so I, mean, I think that that could be a possible turning point here, not to. Again, not not to quarterback for him or anything like that, but I, I do think that might even the perceptions a little bit if, again, there was a little bit more visibility, I think, there. Um, let's see. Um, Chris. Yeah. Real quick, I had a great point there. I think you nailed it. Incumbent presidents running for re-election do not have to traditionally do a lot of heavy lifting. They're expected to win their nomination. Also, right. as president, um, you give up a degree of your privacy in terms of health. Uh, and President Biden, I think it's important to point out, has a physician that has reported very recently that he is cognitively healthy. He is physically healthy. There, there are no medically diagnosed issues with the current president. And to my knowledge, there are none with the former president. So while they are old, they both appear to be extraordinarily healthy. Yeah, and the only thing I would also add to that is there, um, you know, there have been, you know, uh, journalists and things like that that reported on extended interviews with him and, you know, with President Biden at least, um, have said, you know, the, you know, this idea that he's, you know, not able to function or whatever is, you know, a complete exaggeration. There's no, you know, um, that you can, you know, uh, string together words apparently better than I can at, uh, at, at definitely not 81 years of age. Um, so, um, so yeah, I mean, I think that, um, again, not to sort of say, not to minimize the 
the problem because uh, it is a problem. Um, if it, even if it's a perception problem, you know, in politics, perception problems are problems, right? Marketing, you know, perception problems are problems, right? We saw this this over the, um, I mean, heck, we just saw this over the weekend with Wendy's, right? Um, you know, if you talk about, you know, how you're going to give discounts or price things differently at different times of day, right? And if it's framed one way, it sounds like, oh my God, they're going to do surge pricing rather than, you know, you're doing, you're giving people a discount to get people in when they're not normally there, right? Um, it's the same damn thing. It's the exact same economic thing, right? You know, it's just, okay, we're giving away the Frosties cheaper at 2 p.m. Um, as opposed to we're making the Frosties more expensive at 6 p.m. Um, but the grand scheme of things, it's the same deal, right? Um, and so, you know, Again, marketing perception is that reality? Not always, right? Our, uh, again, going back to what, what uh, you know, Dr. Cavalier was talking about about the limits of human perception, perhaps, and also the way that we don't think rationally about costs and benefits and things like that, right? We, we see a discount as good, even though it could just be, you know, a uh, a false discount, right? Um, or we see a, a higher price is bad, even though it could just be an artificial increase, right? Oh, uh, let's see. Um, so we don't have any additional chat questions. So um, we do have one more uh, scripted question, um, not to give Nikki Haley undue amount of attention, but nonetheless, we'll um, give her some attention because um, it's probably the last attention she's gonna get for a while. Um, Sorry, that sounded a little mean. Um, uh, no offense if you're a Nikki Haley fan. Um, but uh, she announced this week that she uh, no longer felt bound by her previous pledge uh, to support the Republican nominee. So those of you that may um, have been living under a rock during the uh, the uh, the uh, Ten Dwarves phase of the nomination contest, right? Um, there was a rule basically that uh, to participate in the Republican debates, you had to agree to support the eventual Republican nominee. The RNC set that rule, and basically, if you didn't do that, you didn't get to show up. But of course, Donald Trump refused to do that, and so he never went to any of the debates. Um, but everybody else agreed to that. Um, now she said she's not going to follow that rule anymore. Um, what, if any, effect do you think this might have effect on the race going forward? Do you think that this might? potentially um, mean that her supporters might not end up supporting Trump in November? Or is this just kind of a nothing burger and kind of the last gasp of a campaign that was pretty much already over anyway? Not to put too fine a point really, on it. Really quickly, and I can answer this fast. Um, and I'm glad you mentioned that point about President Trump not agreeing either. Uh, former ambassador and Governor Nikki Haley saying that she's no longer bound to support whatever the Republican nominee is, I think it will have exactly no effect whatsoever. Um, I, I think it's also, again, important to point out that when it comes to expectations that we're putting on former Governor Haley, that former President Trump himself did not agree to do this either. Um, so I think that's an important thing to keep in mind in terms of perspective. But no, I, I don't I don't see any um, Nikki Haley supporters uh, as a result of this turning around in the, uh, especially in the general election and voting for President Biden. Um, while I could be very, very wrong, um, I, I don't think in terms of the bandwidth of the American voter, such as it is, I don't think this is something that will really impact the election at all. Well, keeping in mind, I could be wrong, but I'm not. <laughs> we 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 can all be wrong. We can all be wrong. Uh, so, uh, uh, but uh, yes, I, I agree. It's, it's not. So at the end of the day, and and I'll even expand my response to this beyond Haley uh, to some of the talks about people defecting from Biden um, because of you know the the, the Israeli Hamas war and, and various other things. Um, at the end of the day. At this moment in time, there's no credible third party or strong independent candidate in this election cycle. This is not 2016. Now, could one emerge? It's possible. I suppose it's probably, I don't know, RFK Jr. might might somehow all of a sudden start resonating, but he hasn't resonated up till this time. Um, and uh, the uh, at the end of the day, um, the vast majority 
of Republicans and Republican leaning voters and the vast majority of Democratic and Democratic leaning voters. And what I mean by vast majority, I mean well in excess of 90 percent. They're going to stick with their guy. At the end of the day, on election day, they are going to stick with their guy. Among the independents, and what I mean by independents is I mean the true independents. I mean the roughly speaking 9 to 11, 12 percent of the electorate that are actual independents, true independents that are that are split ticket voters and, you know, um, down ballot drop off voters and all of that. Those, those folks, in other words, the people that will probably actually solve the election. Um, that's going to come down to turnout and that's going to come down to which which way they go. Uh, I, as to which one, you know, at the end of the day, uh, if there were, if you go, if you went back to 2020 and you said, well, in the Democratic, you know, the Democrats had a love fest between Biden and um, and uh, um, uh, 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 I'm blanking on his name right now, um, the um, uh, Sanders, Bernie Sanders. And you had the you had the Bernie Bros, and I'm telling you, at the end of the day, because they they studied this, they looked at this. What happened to all the Bernie Bros? They voted for Joe Biden. That's what happened to them, you know, overwhelmingly. Uh, and all the people that, and the vast majority, if you went back to 2020, the vast majority of the so-called Never Trumpers, at the end of the day, they went out and they marched in line and they stuck they stuck with the with the boss, and. That will most likely happen again uh, because, you know, there's a long debate about this. Well, why do we only have two parties? And there's lots of reasons why. But at but at one thing at the end of the day is people will usually say, well, um, I may not like everything that Joe Biden or Donald Trump stands for or has done or whatever, but I'm a Democrat or I'm a Republican or in general, I'm neither, but I support more the issues associated with this guy, or I'm responding to a macro effect like the economy. The economy, we're either in uh, in uh, good times and I'm going to reward the incumbent, or we're in bad times and I'm going to go against the incumbent and come a part of the uh, 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 Mophie arena called that retrospective voting. But however they're going to do it, uh, whether they're proactive or reactive, they're going to stick with their guy. Um, and I imagine that that's going to happen this time. So that was a little bit of a long winded answer. But I, I noticed there were some questions in the in the chat about, you know, people defecting from uh, from Biden. So I wanted to I, I don't want to say quell that, but to just to say that that at the all those at the end of the day, people are going to stay. Now, will a small sliver of them possibly defect by not showing up? Yes. And this election is so close at this moment in time that that small sliver, that small reduction in expected turnout could be enough to dictate the winner, one side or the other. And you wouldn't think that would be, but it is. It could, it could come down to a less than 1% difference in a small handful of states. And there you go. Listen, Joe Biden won Georgia by I think it was thirteen thousand votes. Thirteen thousand votes is nothing. Thirteen thousand votes is that thirteen thousand. That's the size of Blackley County, um, you know, population wise. That's nothing. That that could have went either way, and it could still go either way this time around. It'd be the same thing around the country. So it's going to be exciting. Um, you know, just remember, everybody, no matter who wins, don't start pulling out guns and shooting at each other. We we don't want that. We don't need that. We went down that road once. We after the 1860 election, we went down that road. We don't ever want to go down that road again. Uh, we don't ever want to see that ever happen again. OK, so on that semi optimistic note. Okay, Nikki, well, uh, thank you very much uh, for your. Uh, uh, and things like that. So um like to uh thank our panelists uh, for participating. So and also our faculty guests and uh student guests as well for your insightful questions as well. Um so I'd like to thank you all for coming. Uh please do follow us on social media. Uh, you can see our various social links on our uh 
Sly here, MJ Paul Sly is what we're at pretty much everywhere. So Twitter slash X, um, Facebook.com slash MJ Paul Sly, and YouTube.com slash MJ Paul Sly. Um, we do have some upcoming events as well. Our next scheduled event is going to be at the end of this month. Uh, we're going to be talking about the uh, Georgia legislature as we're expecting that's about the time that uh, the uh, <clears throat> What is known as sign a die when the uh, legislature adjourns for uh, the uh, the year will be taking place. So I have a pretty good idea then of what the uh, General Assembly has done um, and what it's expected to do and how it's going to impact your lives. And so we'll uh, have some discussion of that. Um, also, of course, come to our website and find out more about our classes and our programs. Registration does open next week for the fall, and we got some interesting classes that I'm sure that you would be interested in taking. So um, we'll have information posted about those. And of course, you can also find that information in the uh, schedule of classes and things like that as well. Um, so uh, thank you all for coming out. Um, one other thing is that we will be uh, getting a, a video of this posted um, as well as a video of our previous event, we weren't able to get that uh, cleared um, for some reasons. Uh, so um, we are going to have to post an edited version without uh, Dr. Matrock's comments. Um, so that is taking a little longer than I was expecting to get that edited. Um, but um, because of his affiliation with an external entity, they don't want him on tape uh, saying things um, without their permission. So um, so it'll be mostly just uh, me talking to Dr. Hall, apparently. But um, when we do get that edited down, we'll get that posted along with this one, which will be a little bit easier to edit because I won't have to edit out like half the video. Um, so, so keep an eye out for that on our YouTube page. Um, and uh, um, <clears throat> thank you all. And uh, we appreciate your uh, attendance. And hopefully we'll see you soon at one of our upcoming events. And uh, have a good uh, uh, remainder of your evening and a good week. Thank you all very much.